Good evening. I'm John Davis, and this discussion will be on the problem of human scale. Aristotle, in his politics, viewed society and governments in terms of city-states and viewed the appropriate size of such states to be relatively small based around a city of appropriate size to be sufficient sized to be capable of providing for all the needs for the betterment of man. Sufficient territory to provide for the inhabitants' physical needs, but not so large as to be outside of the ability of communications, command, and control. The problem this created, however, was one of insufficient scale to resist invasion or deter warfare between city-states. The Peloponnesian War, the initially sluggish response to the Persian invasion, and the eventual defeat of Greece by Rome being evidence of this shortcoming. Yes, Greek society was the birthplace of classical Western civilization and the birthplace of classic architecture, schools of theater to include comedy and tragedy, and political philosophy, but those proved insufficient in the face of greater organized might. The Roman Republic proved that beyond a certain mass, Republic became unwieldy when Julius Caesar defeated Pompey in the Civil War, assuming the role of emperor in 49 BC. These lessons provided some limits for various types of governments for centuries. Johannes Althusius, a German Calvinist political philosopher, wrote Politica Methodista Digesta Atque Exemplis Sacris et Profanus Illustrata, or Politics Methodically Set Forth and Illustrated with Sacred and Profane Examples, in 1603. In it, Althusius discussed the problems of insufficient and excessive scale. In Chapter 9, Political Sovereignty and Ecclesiastical Communication, he states both, it is useful and necessary to have an abundance of citizens both in time of war and time of peace. In time of war, a large number can better restrain and hold out against external force. A small number is more easily and quickly diminished and ruined by a baleful external uh, misfortune. In time of peace, a large number of people augments the public treasury by their taxes, tolls, fines, business, commerce, and goods. Followed by, on the other hand, a commonwealth or region overflowing with an excess of people is not free from disadvantages and ex exposed to many corruptions. For by such an excess of men, all things are more easily consumed and exhausted. A great scarcity of things develops, and poverty occurs. Nor can so many be ruled easily and well. Nor can concord, good order, and proper discipline be preserved as easily among many persons. They overflow with psychophants, with wealth and corruption, until wealth is preferred among them to virtue, bribes to justice, timidity to courage, and evil to good. He concluded that from these considerations, one may conclude that a commonwealth of medium size is best and steadiest, as he believed it provided the best compromise between security and resistance to corruption. Thomas Ho Hobbes was willing to support a commonwealth of greater size in his treatise Leviathan, but based his evaluation on similar realizations. In part two of Commonwealth chapter 17, he stated, nor is it joining together of small number of men that gives them this security, because in small numbers, small additions on the one side or the other may give the advantage of strength so great as it is sufficient to carry the victory, and therefore gives encouragement to invasion. As Hobbes saw the role of government was to moderate men's baser desires pre preventing anarchy, this situation was unacceptable. However, he subsequently stated, and be there never so great a multitude, yet if their actions be directed according to their particular judgments and particular appetites, they can expect no defense nor protection, neither against a common enemy nor against the injuries of one another. His side note suggested, nor from a great multitude and less directed by one judgment. These evaluations seem to support Jean-Jacques Rousseau's conclusion in the social contract that taxes are burdensome just to the extent that the government is remote from the people. 
The latter are, therefore, burdened least heavily in a democracy, somewhat more heavily in an aristocracy, and most heavily in a ma monarchy. Thus, monarchy is su suited only to states that are wealthy, aristocracy to states of middling wealth and size, and democracy to states that are poor and tiny. All of these facts gained over centuries of study, practice, and evaluation put America in a peculiar position. We still ascribe to being a federal republic of subordinate states, although our population is well in excess of 300 million, and many claim our system of government to be a democracy. Even many of our states are so excessively large, but contain excessively large cities to include New York, Chicago, and Atlanta as examples that citizens in the remainder of these states feel their voices are unheard and they are excessively taxed while insufficiently represented. This also applies in reverence to what are called flyover country compared to the heavily populated coastal regions. This status of an excessively large population in geographic area is leading to such divergent beliefs that we find ourselves in much the same position as America was in just prior to the Civil War. And once again, many of our representatives, as well as the media, insist on f fanning the flames of division. This in turn has resulted in a rash of dog-eat-dog -dog behavior with examples posted on social media of mass theft and basic disregard for civic mindedness and even more divisive rhetoric. What will eventually come of this is beyond the purview of this discussion, but if history is any indicator, the portents are not favorable. Thank you.